Welcome, heathens and witches, to the Horn and Cauldron Podcast. Podcast. Yeah, so I'm John Norgrove. This is Julie Norgrove. This is another episode of the Horn and Cauldron Podcast. Today we are talking about types of fae. Yeah. Yeah, types of fae. So uh, let's get right into it. Oh, before then, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel for more, and, uh, you know, check out the rest of the podcast. Uh, do all that sort of stuff. And if you're listening to us on your podcast network of choice, leave us a review because that's the only way we know that you listened. Uh, so we'll just jump right into types of fae from around the world. Yeah. So um, we're kind of taking a tour around the world of different fae creatures. There are so, 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 so many um, types of fae that it's... it it's going to take several episodes for us to kind of like get through them all. But whether you call them fairies or fair folk or fae or something completely different, they're an intriguing part of the greater magical and folkloric tapestry of cultures around the world. And a lot of interesting things about them is that we really see a lot of similarities between different cultures around the world and sort of what the fairies of that culture sort of turn into and how people kind of interact with them. And, um, you know, there's, there's so many stories of like being like, Oh, don't talk to them. They're scary, but also that they live in harmony with nature and also that they're sometimes helpful to people. So it's a really interesting piece of it. We're not really going to be going into sort of like the basics of the Fae in this episode. I highly recommend that you listen to episode nine, which is working with the Fae. And we talk a lot about the basics of working with the Fae, general Fae um, stuff, yeah. general Fae stuff, how to kind of get started, basically. I do a lot of Fae magic myself, so I have a lot of interesting um, perspectives on this. Um, so we're pretty much going to jump right in. Uh, right now, if you're listening to this when this comes out, um, there is a trend on TikTok about talking about the the origin of the word goblin. And there are certain terms for different types of fairies that actually have been used derogatorily um, for as slang for people of color, such as brownie, goblin, and even leprechaun. Um, used for various this. ethnic groups as mm -hmm. derogatory slang. And not only are we not going to be talking about that here, we're actually not going to be talking about those types of fae in general here, just because there's only so much time I have. Um, but also, um, you know, don't 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 be a jerk. Don't don't yeah. use that no. as, as a slang. No, um, assholes. but that also assholes. doesn't mean that you can't refer to those specific types of fae yeah. just because there is a derogatory slang associated with that. I've literally never heard a derogatory slang about the word goblin. I mean, I've definitely heard people be called goblins. Yeah, but that's generally because they're like small and trying to steal your treasure. <laughs> so you know, like a goblin. Yeah. Um, so, and if yeah. you don't know, like John, what I'm talking about, then that's good. You haven't stumbled onto that particular corner of the Internet. Yeah. Um, you know, so, yeah, don't uh, don't be racist. Uh, this is a open and welcoming space here. Yeah. So before we start talking about the different types of fae, I want to talk briefly about what animalism is. So animalism is a belief that all things are spiritual. Rocks, mountain trees, buildings, whatever. This A binder, this mug, mm. this table, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, and it is actually one of the most common religious beliefs throughout the world, uh, but it's not necessarily a religion itself. It usually sort of manifests as a component of many different religions. And um, kind of part of this is like um, people who are animate uh, see the spiritual nature of things, many things in the world, but each thing is a unique being as opposed to all being sort of tied to like one greater uh, creator. And it's possible that sort of this animalistic belief is something that brought about the Fae or helps us to understand those types of things. So a lot of Fae type beliefs are tied into animalism in individual cultures, um, but isn't necessarily part of of that culture um, is sort of part of the greater like human experience. <clears throat> so 
with that brief little bit of animalism out of the way, um, let's uh, let's get started. So we're going to start in uh, Northern Europe with the Eos Sea, which are also called the Sidhi, um, and sometimes are also called the Thuadunan, or Tuatha de Danon, if you say it. Um, the Tuatha de Danon? Yeah, <laughs> if you say it American. So the uh, Thuadhe Dunan uh, race of beings comes from Irish folklore, and they may have actually been pushed under the role of being fairies during the Christianization of Europe. We talk a bit about this in our Working with the Fae episode, episode nine, so if you want to hear more about that, as well as us stumbling over the pronunciation of this, because I remember like having <laughs> a time yeah. with that. Um, definitely listen to that. I, I have no doubt that there are both Bold and strong opinions on how it is supposed to be pronounced. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's how accents work, guys. Some people say shit differently. Yeah. I'm a California girl born and bred, so I'm definitely going to say things in that manner. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, the this is really kind of the most common interpretation of fairies in media and in magic and originates from Northern Europe and especially the UK. I think Ireland, Scotland and even parts of Wales have some very similar beliefs <clears throat> and uh, sort of practices associated with them. Uh, the Sidhi uh, live in the other world, sometimes called the land of the dead or the land of the fae or, you know, kind of whatever. Uh, but they are able to typically access our realm through fairy circles and fairy mounds, um, which is interesting because fairy mounds are generally thought to be ancient burial mounds. Um, most of them are, some of them are not, and some of them we don't know. Um, but it's a uh, kind of an interesting, uh, sort of equation there with land of the dead and that sort of thing. Um, and they typically have a territory that they guard or man maintain and can be appeased with offerings. Um, you also have within this sort of subset of Fae in, um, Northern Europe, the Seely Court, which was for fairies that like playing harmless pranks and were generally pretty friendly. Um, and then you have the unseely court, which were fairies that were generally malicious to humans. Um, just sort of like across the board there. And then you had trooping fairies who lived in small camps and traveled from place to place and were like neither really um, beneficial or, or malefic. They just sort of like are in the middle there. Sometimes they're nice, sometimes they're not nice. Um, but there's a lot that goes into this belief. And really the, you know, a lot of the information is don't deal with the fae because they're bad and they're going to hurt you but the thing is is you just kind of have to like well it's like some types of fae it's sort of to, just to i mean circle back around to the racist thing it's sort of like classifying a whole ass race of people based on one bad interaction with exactly people, yeah you know so like yeah i think every time i hear that just like ah all like all fairies are are malicious and bad. I'm just like, that seems that seems a bit racist, but like you believe what you got to believe to sleep at night, guy. Yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um and just keep in mind that for the most part with my experience that they're very literal, so they're very like tit for tat. They don't um you know, there's this thing about not saying thank you. It's because they don't really understand that if they're doing something for you, they expect an equivalent exchange as a gift or an offering in return. And if you give them a gift or an offering just sort of unasked for, then they're going to give you something of equivalent value to them in return. So that's kind of like the big basic guide to not pissing off the Fae. <laughs> so sticking with Northern Europe, but moving to a different type of Fae is the Puka. Um, and these are shapeshifters and they either give bad or good luck. Um, so they're often um, seen as humans. And when they are in their human form, they uh, most likely have animal features like a tail or ears. Sometimes those belonging to like a cat or a fox, a wolf, a dog, sometimes a horse, sometimes a goat. I may have already said goat. <laughs> uh, and usually their fur or their hair is dark in color. These are found pretty widely in Irish, Scottish, and Scandinavian and sort of like smattering of places um, throughout Northern European folklore. Lore. And they're very, very mischievous. In fact, they generally tempt humans into taking a ride on their back. They usually show up as an animal or like a hairy humanoid in this case. And um, 
They then, once they've talked the human into taking a ride on their back, they take the human on a horrifying ride. It's fast and it's scary it's um, okay. uh, around the countryside before dropping the human off where they encounter them in the first place. Uh <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that just sounds like an ancient roller coaster. That doesn't sound very mischievous. That sounds like there'd be tickets. <clears throat> You know? Kind of, Corn kind of. And shit. Uh, in fact, these beliefs are so widespread about the puka is, is, is that in Ireland, it was said that if you wore spurs or carried a sharp object with you, you could control the puka on your wild ride. Um, and some were even described as being murderous, malicious, and even cannibals. So, uh, but also in some tales, they're helpful. Um, maybe this is because the humans in these tales were also friendly and helpful. Um, that sort of seems to be a correlating factor here, um, not just with this, but with a lot of this Fey stuff. Um, sometimes the pukas would even complete household tasks or help humans avoid a deadly accident or a different malicious creature like in the forest. And a puka is uh, not to be confused with a kelpie, which is a shapeshifter that uh, generally takes on a, a horse or a human shape that lives in the locks of Scotland. Hmm. And the whole time I was reading about the puka, I was like, these guys are like, kind of like um, the roller coaster version of werewolves. I I just I kept picturing the them as like werewolves. little as like tiny bigfoots. Well, that would just be regular feats. Well, yeah, I guess, but yeah. you know. Tiny feats. <laughs> so uh, next up, we're moving over to uh, Norse tradition, um, and we're talking about the Landvatir and the Landisir. Um, so these are land spirits and sometimes interpreted as spirits of the dead. Um, there's different uh, sort of subsets within these, but really we're going to, we're not really going to be talking about like elves and dark elves here. Um, we're going to save that for the next episode. Uh, we're really going to be talking about the land spirit part of the land vatir and the land this year. Um, and they protect and maintain especially beautiful natural formations like rocks and trees and mountains and forests and that sort of thing. And um, even in modern day Iceland, some practices around the land vatir still survive. So people will bring food and offerings to places they think that they live and they may not mow or build in that spot or even let children play on them those things um, so as not to upset them. And in particular, one story that I came across was um, they were about ready to start construction on the Keflavik Air Base in Iceland. And the foreman dreamed that a woman came to him asking to delay moving a boulder to give her family time to move out. So he delayed for weeks um, while like apparently Americans were like, hurry it up already um, until this woman came to him in another dream telling him that her family, the Landvatir, were all moved out. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and, and not only that, um, Iceland, Iceland keeps alive a lot of these types of things. There's some traditions around elves and stuff like that, too, um, that they keep alive. But on the Icelandic crest, they have four types of landvatir on there that help to protect Iceland. Mm. Uh, so it's it's pretty dope. <clears throat> now, moving south and also maybe backwards in time, ancient Rome also had sort of fey folk. Uh, they had genius Loki or genii locorum. That's the plural of them. Um, and those were the protective spirits of a place. There were, it was really common to have altars for these and they were usually depicted as holding a cornucopia, a bowl or a snake and you would just like leave offerings. A thing to hold stuff, a thing to hold stuff and an angry spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. I don't know. Uh, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things <laughs> will bite you if you're wrong. So that's a, that's a very chaos list of things that yeah. you chose to represent these uh, statuaries. <laughs> Yeah. Now, um, we actually don't know a lot about how the Greeks or I'm sorry, how the how the ancient Romans like interacted with these. Um, it is assumed that they sort of had like a place of honor within a home. So they had uh, like home genies, basically. Mm -hmm. And then there were like neighborhood genies. And then there was like sort of like a genie associated with the Roman Empire. In particular, one emperor, Emperor Augustus. I don't remember which one, but Emperor Augustus was like, I am the genie of Rome. 
Mm. You have to give me offerings and mm. praise. Mm. <laughs> I don't mm. think that lasted for very long yeah. for him. Yeah, that's, that sounds like something somebody would say. It does. <clears throat> it does. And a part of the reason why we kind of don't really know a lot about this is because we know more about the Greek side of this, which um, is pretty prevalent in the mythology. So the Greeks don't have just one thing that's fairies. Really what they have is nymphs. And nymphs are the closest that we get to that in ancient Greek tradition. Nymphs are connected to the land and typically act as minor gods and goddesses, mostly goddesses though. And of nymphs, we kind of have different like subsets. So we have satyrs, which are half man, half goat, and they're typically found in the forest. These aren't necessarily classified as nymphs per se. I'm just sort of lumping them in here because they sort of fit this mold um, that I'm looking at to, to um, sort of talk about fairies. Um, and then there's nereids, which are sea nymphs. So they're like sea fairies. And then there are dryads, which are tree nymphs. So in ancient Greek mythology, we have a lot of nymph stuff happening. Some of them are descended from the gods. Some of them are primordial beings. Some of them just spring in to existence um, and they have a variety of interesting um, stories about them and they just sort of like hang out in a particular place and just like do whatever they're going to do until whoever else is in the story sort of comes by and interacts with them and that's really the sort of the criteria <laughs> that I'm looking at there so yes we do kind of have fairies in Greek culture but like not really it's not in the, the same, same it's way. not the same thing yeah but, yeah. It's, like, but it's like close enough yeah, another close enough one is ancient Egypt. And and we know even sort of less about this than we do about even the Greeks and the Romans. Um, and the thing that is the closest to fae folk in ancient Egypt is the concept of ka. Um, and most about what we know about ka pertains to people. Ka is your spirit. You could equate that to being like your soul or your astral body, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, but the ancient Egyptians believed that all things have ka, um, including foods and places and objects. I've read that in ancient Egypt, when they had festivals at temples, they would, when they would leave food as offerings, they would basically have a period of time where you wouldn't eat that food so that the gods can absorb the ka from that food. And then afterwards you were able to eat it. So if anybody's ever like, oh, I don't know if I can eat these offerings that I'm leaving for this deity I'm working with. I mean, that's how the ancient Egyptians did it. They still ate it because they're like, we're not going to waste good food. <laughs> so, you know, we do know that they had some practices associated with Ka that were not about people. Um, but we also know that they had statues that were Ka. It's basically like a human head on like a bird body. Mm -hmm. um, and these statues were sometimes used to stand in for people who had made the journey to Duat or the, uh, the underworld, people who had died. And um, these little statues they like put in tiny houses and mausoleums inside of their homes and places of worship. And they would often stand in for um, a person during a, you know, like a ceremony or a ritual or something like that. Um, but the thing is, is we don't really know much more than that. There are some like very old tomb paintings that sort of give the idea that maybe Ka pertains to, uh, like there are like spirits associated with Ka that can sort of help and hinder things. Um, and there, like when you look at what the ancient Egyptians use these things for, it's it, it's an easy sort of thought to go, well, they might have done that. They might have looked at this in a similar way to the way that we now in like modern Western culture look at fairies. But also maybe they didn't. We don't really know, but they may have also used these statuettes for like placating land spirits or spirits of a place because the Egyptians did believe that basically everything in the world was full of magic and for them to believe that everything was full of magic and to not sort of have this belief out of all of the cultures in the world that do have this belief just sort of seems off to me and it feels to me like we just don't know yet what that looks like whether it's ka or whether it's something else hmm. yeah so we're actually going to move south now into Africa. We're going to be looking at Benin, which is in uh, West Africa. It's kind of like on the Ivory Coast there. Uh, and they have uh, beings called the Aziza there. 
And um, these actually look probably the closest to what we interpret as modern day fairies. The Aziza lived in the forest and helped people in exchange for offerings. They were said to live in natural features like ant hills or trees, that sort of thing. And they taught humans how to hunt and how to use fire and basically how to be civilized when the humans got there. Uh, but they are very shy and they live deep, deep, deep in the forest. And um, they also have wings like butterflies. Hence the modern fairy thing. There are some stories that talk about them being malicious, but that's really kind of with every thing that's a fairy, um, you know, we really sort of have that. But in yeah, general, they seem to be a lot more um, a lot more nice, mm. especially to people who live nearby than other types of, of fae folk. Mm, dope, dope. Yeah. Yeah. So. Sticking with Africa, we're going to move to uh, the Biloko, which uh, are, this comes from the area that is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. But I believe that this um, belief particularly is um, from what we would, what we would, I guess, previously call the area of Zaire. Um, and Biloko live in hollow trees deep in the forest, and they protect various parts of the forest. So trees, flowers, treasure, they especially called out treasure. <laughs> yeah, again, same thing, right? Trees, flowers, big old boxes of gold, same thing, same yeah. exact thing. Fancy rocks, yeah. Yeah, rock and roll. Um, it is said that the Biloko are not friendly to humans. Most of what I've seen about them, they are people eaters. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't stories out there. It's not easy for me to find information about an about an old belief from Central Africa as an American living in the times that we're in now. So, um, you know, that's sort of my PSA asterisk is I am doing my best to represent things as well as I can, particularly for areas that may have been um, traditionally sort of pushed down by those in power, whoever those in power happen to be. Um, so uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so most of the stories are where the, the Boloco are not friendly to humans, uh, but they are small, like about, uh, about knee height and they are adorable, but it kind of, it, it, it kind it's kind of like all of the, these stories um, give off the idea that the Boloco have a grudge to settle with humans. Mm -hmm. Like they're upset with humans and kind of like getting back at them, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they also carry little bells and they entrance humans nearby with their bells and then they kill them and eat them. Hmm. Uh, which is interesting um, when you talk about the bells thing, because um, in um, in like northern European sort of fairies, they typically have um, they they typically have voices like bells or that sort of thing, or you can hear a tinkling of bells when fairies are around. So it's interesting that this comes up, and I don't know if they're linked in any way, but um, it is an interesting uh, coincidence happening there. Yeah. So moving into India, uh, they have Yaksha and Yakshini. And uh, these are also nature spirits tied to the land and also sometimes treasure. Very important. <laughs> some are friendly, some are malicious. Um, and they're really just sort of like guardians of the land that usually also have supernatural powers. So and the supernatural powers vary a lot. Um, uh, some of them, you know, they can like see the future or they can breathe fire. And one of them is particularly good at Tantra. So, you know, they all have sort of their own thing. And even some of them have temples. Um, in fact, in the Middle Ages, Joala Mani, uh, Joala Mylini, sorry, uh, had a temple built to honor her as a tantric and fire deity uh, for the Jain religion. Uh, and there, it, it sort of depends on the regional religious belief, but um, about these Yaksha and Yakshini, um, that depending on the religion, these are immortal spirits or they're mortal beings or they're gods. There's kind of a lot happening there. So it's difficult for for me to say this is what they are because the beliefs between the main three religious groups about these particular entities is 
similar, but also not. There's a lot of Venn diagram stuff happening there. Mm -hmm. So I'm picking things from the center of the Venn diagram. <laughs> so moving into Japan, we have the Kami. Uh, and there are other types of Japanese like fairies. So don't, don't get at me for not talking about yokai, but um, we're gonna talk about the Kami today. Uh, kami are um, sometimes land spirits. They're also sometimes natural forces like wind or water or even laughter. Um, sometimes they're animals and sometimes they're even ancestors who are who can be both beneficial or harmful, depending on what the situation is. Um, they are, not only do they sort of have this, like they can be spirits or natural forces or whatever, but they're also generally tied to places or things or natural phenomena, or sometimes even states of being. Um, there were people who would um, essentially reach a ritual trance and then they are basically interacting within that ritual as the kami of rituals. Um, so there's, we definitely see a lot of animism in that type of, um, bit there. And, um, uh, one of the interesting things about the kami that's different than Western folklore is that people are expected to keep the kami happy. We do see that in Western folklore with fairies. Um, but the kami are also expected to perform their role. So if you have a kami that is in particular charge of say like a fish pond, um, then you as the human who lives near this fish pond are expected to bring the kami offerings and to help and to take care of the kami as well yeah. as this, this fish pond. Yeah, but yeah, the kami totally. is also on the hook for taking care of this fish pond, hmm. so, uh, which is not really something that we typically see with Western fairies. But in my working with them, that is definitely a thing. You know, there's a, um, a reciprocal relationship that you have. And uh, much like with in much like with the previous one with India, there's a lot of variations here based on re on region and religion. So, again, I'm just taking the center of this Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, and this is I mean, you know, this is really like that. And I hate the term like 50,000 foot look at that stuff. But this is really like a 50,000 foot look, right? I mean, this is sort of like the like the highlights for each one of these regions as we sort of like cross the globe with these things. If there's like, like if you have a, like a particular um, piece of information about these fey um, or fey like creatures, like with your background, and like have more information or want to share it or whatever, then like, you know, like go come over to the YouTube video if you're listening to this on a podcast or if you're already on the YouTube video, like comment below with that and share it with everybody else so we can all learn yeah, like absolutely. together or like link a book that you like that has the stuff in it or, you know, yeah. whatever. Or if there's a type of fae that you want to hear more about, yeah. you know, let us know yeah. as well. We can always bring it up in a, uh, in a, as a pub chat question. So if you have a question or comment mm -hmm. about it there, we can always kind of like do a little micro deep dive in that direction. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So moving in our little world trip here, <laughs> we're moving over to Australia where they have the Mimi. Um, and these are, um, they're very thin, they're very tall, um, for fey folk, uh, but it's, um, it's uh, sort of spoken that a very strong wind would break them in half. That's how tall and thin they are. Um, <clears throat> and they live in the rock country, which is sort of like the West and Southwestern part of Australia, but the belief in the Mimi, um, permeates throughout all of the indigenous peoples of Australia. It's just that's where they happen to live is in the rock formations. Uh, and they live either in caves or in cracks of the rocks there. They have like full on, like they have clothing and they do their hair and they have weapons and they make food and they're, they're just like a tribe of like, um, humanoids basically um and they lived there before humans and it is said that they actually created the first cave paintings and rock paintings in australia and that was not humans and not only did they live there before humans and did all this stuff before them but they also taught the first humans that came to australia how to paint how to hunt sing dance and cook uh, basically how to be civilized and we saw this 
again with um, the Aziza from Benin. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's actually something that I saw with a lot of other fairies that we're not talking about here. This is a fairly common um, piece of that puzzle there. And they are mischievous, these Mimi. They are sometimes benevolent, sometimes they're dangerous. So sometimes they would take in humans to live among them and humans would like live in their camps for years reportedly. Um, But also sometimes they'd kidnap and eat humans. Mm. Um, so <laughs> we don't know. Maybe the kidnap and eat is a bit of a wives' tale to keep kids in line. To but keep also... kids out of caves, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it is definitely there. There's some very interesting stuff that you can find about the Mimi um when you look at what um the indigenous people of Australia are saying about them. So if you happen to be looking at it, it's the Um, You can see artwork of them and they're just like very tall and thin. And as soon as I saw the artwork of these, I was like, oh, my gosh, I've definitely seen that artwork in those like aliens shows on Discovery. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, right. Oh, what is that? Confusing aliens. Yeah. Those shows. All right. Yeah. Is it a mystery? Aliens. Why not aliens? Yeah. So we're going to change that. Is it a mystery? Fairies. Yeah. Fae folk. (laughs) Yeah. So moving across the Pacific Ocean, sort of, uh, now we come to Hawaii. And in Hawaii, they have the Menehune. And they, um, you're going to see a lot of similarities here. So they leave, live deep in the wilderness of the Hawaiian Islands. And they also predated Polynesian settlers. So they lived there before the Polynesians did. And they were amazing craftspeople. And they came out at night to build beautiful things like homes and temples, canoes, ponds, etc. And only their children and the humans that are connected to them can see them. To everybody else, they're invisible. Um, and it, it is said that they taught um, the early Polynesian and Hawaiian settlers um, like how to do a bunch of things, like how to make really good canoes and all these other things. Um, but it's also rumored that they created the Menehune fish pond, which is the largest man-made fish pond in Kauai. And it's on the register of um, like historical places in for the U.S. And it was possibly made in the 15th century. In the 1400s, that was made. So um, it's super interesting. Um, And they um, they sort of look similar to the Beloko, where they're like small and like really adorable looking. Um, But when I was reading about these guys, I was like, oh, Keebler elves. Now I know where that comes from. Uh, But also the amazing craftspeople who come at night thing is certainly not um, only limited to the Menehune in the Hawaiian culture. There are plenty of other fey folk across across the world, and especially in um, like Central and Western or Central and Eastern Europe, where we sort of see that like craftspeople come out at night thing. Um, Yeah. Mm, yeah that's awesome yeah i did not know that about this fish pond and i was like dang so someday we're gonna have to go to Kauai. yeah and right? check that out check out that sweet <laughs> fish pond maybe maybe magic fish pond maybe a magical fish pond yeah uh so um looking at in more indigenous type of things we're moving into the americas and we're looking at the iroquois culture and they have beings that are called the joka and they are mischievous and they like playing tricks so it's dangerous to disrespect them it can cause sickness misfortune especially sickness sickness very tied into making these guys mad basically um and you can tell if they're around if you hear drumming but there are no drums or if you see a ring of bare earth so think a fairy circle but without like you know mushrooms basically Mm -hmm. uh, or see a bowl-shaped depression in the mud Mm. and if you see a bowl-shaped depression in the mud it is not only common, but definitely recommended that you leave them an offering, preferably of tobacco or fingernails. Well, those are very different kinds of offerings. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Rock Without roll. getting too deep into it, the tobacco is to just like general appeasement and the fingernails are to help the Joga ward off other uh, malicious spirits that smell like fingernails. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and they also protect different aspects of the land and um, have been known to help humans and just sort of like be seen uh, by humans as well. So we're seeing definitely a lot of that same thing as we sort of cross the world. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, next we're going to move a little bit south and we're going to talk about the fufale, which is uh, from Cajun tradition. So it's a little bit more modern. Mm -hmm. Still looking at America, though. Uh, And the fufale is a spirit that appears as a ghostly orb of light in swampy areas. It's pretty similar to a Mm will-o'-the-wisp. And um, they are mischievous and sometimes malicious. Uh, And maybe they suck the blood of children. Um, And... these the the will of the wisp is something that is seen also throughout other cultures in the world um so there's sort of like that venn diagram yeah. thing happening yeah. here again um but really um the way that they are talked about from what i was able to find um is very fairy like so you know you, you not so much leaving them offerings but the idea of they're mischievous, so beware, because maybe they are going to help you, but maybe they are going to hurt you. Maybe um, they're going to eat your kids. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what did, uh, what, what, there's a, a book we read one time where the um, ogres or whatever um, refer to human babies as screech berries oh because they yeah. like they like make they like make screaming noises but are especially delicious or, so, yeah, or something like yeah. that i don't i don't remember which book series it was but um yeah i think about that anytime like like ah this this monster is gonna eat a kid i always think of that like screech berries or or um yeah, I think they called them screech berries. They did call them screech berries. And there was like a whole story about the ogres and, you know, sort of. Um, yeah, well, it was there was I mean, there were like several books in the series. I think there were three books in the series or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's not important. Uh, it is the uh, dis the 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 dis series d i s dystopia disillusioned and disenchanted those are probably out of order um by robert croce um yeah, yeah very fun very very yeah, tongue really cheek. really good books really good books yeah. yeah yeah so still in the americas moving south um into mayan culture there is the alu um, which are nature spirits and sometimes ancestors that live in the Yucatan Peninsula uh, these are usually invisible unless they are communicating with or scaring away humans. Um, and sometimes they will also be uh, visible to congregate and party. So it sounds very much like fairies to me. Uh, <laughs> they are also tied to natural features and they are also known to play tricks. Um, some people believe that the Alux um, could make deals with uh, like farmers to bring them abundant har- harvests or that they would ask for offerings from humans. Like if they're passing by somebody's house, they're like, Hey, give me some of that food. And then if the humans were like, no, they would, you know, do mischievous yeah. and bad things. But if the humans were like, Oh yeah, sure. Here, have some, they would um, then bless them with, with positive things. Another thing that we see really commonly with a lot of um, fairy type uh, legends. And um, there are, There are these like two story homes. Some of them are tiny. Some of them are quite large uh, and some of them are regular home size um, that ancient people built. And they may have actually built these homes for them to live in uh, sort of as offerings, but also just homes, you know, to kind of take care of them and to help them out. And uh, sometimes the looks are called uh, duende, which is Spanish uh, for the word goblin, basically. Hmm. All right. I mean, well, so like it was a brief journey around the world, sort of, to like kind of look at a bunch of fairies. But then like let's sort of classify where we've talked about with fairies. It seems that fairies are are nature spirits associated with with a specific feature in nature. Yeah. Generally some function of mischievous yeah uh you know some are more visible or less visible some are more helpful or less helpful you know it's sort of you know it's that thing where it's like every culture has a dragon yeah you know and it might not be the same kind of dragon oh it's a drake or it's a wyvern or it's a serpent or whatever but like it's that thing where like we all sort of have like a cut like we all have like a uh like a connection yeah. across cultures to this like idea and that idea happens to be like fey folk 
which, you know, we're using the term fey folk, but that's just because, like, that's the, like, kind of normalized term in English. I mean, we could like, say fairy, but to me, fairy is a bit more, like, um, it, it's reserved for more of the fantasy side of things. In my mind, if you sure. use fairy, like, that's no hate literally at all. Yeah. But to me, there's sort of, like, a delineation there between, like, fantasy and what I consider to be, like, actual actual magic and beings mm -hmm. so yeah, that's why okay. i use fey okay yeah sure 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 totally totally what uh what term do you like to use uh good listener dear listener what term do you like <laughs> to use for fairies or fey folk or or, or whatever yeah you know? uh that's that's interesting i guess i kind of just use whichever word comes to mind first <laughs> You know, in also, the moment. if you're using the word fairy, you have to decide, are you putting that E in there? Does it end with a with an E or with a Y? There's a lot. But if I you mean, just say fey. You're just talking about boom, typing. Boom, boom, when you're saying yeah. stuff, it doesn't matter what it what it ends with. Yeah, but these notes, that's just how your sound they're comes on the out paper. Of your well, they're not on the paper. They're yeah. digital. Well, but, I mean, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. Yeah. We'd also love to hear, like, what your experience was with working with the fey are. Um, we have wonderful experiences working with the Fae. We talk about, I talk about this a lot. And, um, you know, we have Fae that are very active where we live and they help uh, to protect us and our home. And um, in in payment for that, we have basically built a reciprocal kind of relationship bond with them where we help them out. They help us out. We'll sometimes just see little gifts. Like one day there was just a statue of like a ram that showed up at our house yeah we don't know where that came from uh but so we have that now uh we lost an axe in the woods we've like ju it's just gone by the way just gone yeah and it was lost like in the middle of a bunch of us all we were like throwing axes at some targets yeah and like one of them just got absorbed by the earth yeah or yeah. something and they also uh, brought you what like a like a bag of cement well we found well i mean we've just found like a bunch of weird stuff yeah you know around the property and such so as we like take care of the property and like clean it up and things like that i mean you know it's it's that thing where like everybody kind of has a different experience with it i think that you know you're a very like active participant with the fey sort of yeah. a situation uh Whereas for me, I just sort of talk to everything all the time. <laughs> like I'm the guy, like, like I'm the guy when like, uh, like if like, uh, you're walking and like a leaf falls out of a tree and gets you, I'll just be like, what are you fucking doing to this, to a tree? You know, like I'm, I'm that. <laughs> There's that animism again. <laughs> I'm, I'm that person. I just like talk to everything, whatever, you know, it, it fucking gets it. Speaking English, right? Whatever. Uh, so yeah, I guess it's a little, it's a little bit more like land of a for yeah. me, like sort of that, like that, like everything has a spirit kind yeah. of a thing. You know, I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that I like work with the Fae, you know, yeah. but I also don't you not sort of participate do by proxy, in, if nothing else. Yeah. Well, yeah. and, and I mean, like, I, I, like I do work with like from my perspective with like the land of a tear and like, w you know, moving the earth and doing the garden and building stuff and like helping sort of like clean up and like better maintain like the forest and, and things like that uh, around the property. So I guess that's kind of like my sort of like association uh, in quotes with the, yeah. uh, with the Fae. You know, even though I don't really use that term, like working with the Fae, for me, the Fae is like very specifically the term, like, like the term for the Tuahadadanan, mm -hmm. right? Uh, insofar as like Tuahadadan is also the right word, but just way longer to say. Um, well, it sort of depends. Tuahadadanan yeah. is kind of like a... It's very specific. Well, it is very specific, but also like, so they're also like a race of beings. And we talked about this in the Dagda deep dive episode a little bit that mm. when the Christianization of Europe happened, one of the things that happened and, and not just 
with the Dagda, but with other deities as well, but especially the Dagda, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an easy way to sort of like bring that to light is that the um, monks and the missionaries that were trying to convert people would intentionally try to um, sort of lessen the, the native religion that people were practicing. And in one way with the Dagda, they basically were like, he's a drunk, ugly oaf yeah. whose clothes don't fit him, you know, uh, as opposed to like a powerful deity. And it is it is thought by by several scholars that the Tuatha are considered fairy folk because of this mm. um there's a lot like that rel goes relegate that. them from gods to simple land spirits yeah yeah sure, and, sure, and sure, also sure. like the monks and we talked about this in in episode nine working with the fae um christian monks also um for a time to sort of make it so that people who believed in fairies could also be part of the church to kind of like meld those beliefs they um also wrote and believed and taught that fairies and land spirits were fallen angels mm. and that, so they were like okay yeah basically to be around so um you know that's that's kind of like the the sort of like drinking game yeah christianization of europe guys sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> for you <laughs> yeah hmm. all right so next up is uh spells yeah spell. so we only have one spell for you today but that's because we have just a list of stuff that we went through. Um, so this is a home protection spell and you can use this um, with other deities if you prefer, but this is sort of like especially written for fey folk. And um, just as a reminder, this spell as well as all the spells that we share are spells that we create ourselves. Yeah, uh, yeah they have no on, historical yeah, association. Based on our experience and particular traditions. So, yeah. you know, it's not a particular thing um so this is a protection spell and you don't really need anything for this but you can also add stuff to this if you want so really what this spell is going to be doing is you're going to be making a bargain with the fae to protect your home or your space and um so using suggestions from the correspondence table which we're going to read um uh, some items from in a couple of minutes um or just sort of like things that you think that the fae would like or things that you like that you want to use create a small space where you can leave offerings and gifts for the fae it is recommended that this is sort of like a dedicated area and this could actually be part of your regular offerings it doesn't have to be separate you know i mean especially if you work with several deities or ancestors you know there's how many offering plates can you fit on yeah. your altar yeah. table i use one offering thing i use one little plate and i use one little cup and that's all that i use and it's just sort of like the communal yeah thing to inhale the ka <laughs> basically so um so have this little space uh and then once this space feels complete to you uh place your first offering and say fair folk those who watch the wild things grow please watch high and please watch low protect my home from any foe as payment, this offering I bestow. And you can say that every time you do this, maybe you only do this once. It's kind of up to you yeah. where you really recharge sort of like the space, feel and like you want to go with put that. it down. And and you often see, and you know this this came up in the uh, uh, in in the previous parts of the podcast where like you give them like you like you build them a little house, you you give them a little space. Yeah. You know, think of like um like a fairy garden. Yeah. You know, or like tiny town at Christmas time, you know, like if you got them tiny buildings that you put yeah. like under your tree or like you build a tiny town somewhere. I fucking love that tiny town stuff like ferociously. <laughs> so we have a bunch of them. I need to like repaint a bunch of them because a lot of those industrial ones are like not great. Paint yeah. wise, yeah. but like that's fine. Yeah. And if you're looking to build a fairy garden or to attract Fae to you, we have a spell for that in episode nine, working with the Fae. Yep. So that's a pretty easy way to kind of like um pop into that. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So uh next up, correspondences. Yeah. So um these are just suggested correspondences. You can go with kind of whatever else you want for the Fae. Um so animals would be like um fireflies, mice, frogs, 
chipmunks, kind of anything that a fairy could ride. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like sweet fairy mounts. Yeah, exactly. Colors would be like green or yellow or brown, a lot of earth tones, but also flower colors is kind of a really loose one here with the colors. As for stones, um, fuchsia, moss agate, and quartz are particularly great for fairies. Uh, plants berries and clover and foxglove and hawthorn and rowan as well as wood sorrel which we have a ton of yeah uh, where we live <laughs> yeah we do a ton yeah um and for foods uh bread and butter cakes candies cream fruit milk um any sort of liquor um the fae that we work with here particularly like fizzy drinks yeah um so that's a, a fun one to leave uh there are some deities that you can work with associated with this any of the tuahedadanan pan morgan le fay aspara would all work uh and then miscellaneous objects um anything shiny um or pretty uh so like coins also old trees or small caves you know natural features uh doll houses and miniatures um any sort of like revelry particularly outside and then also beltane and Samhain are associated with the fae uh as well as um dusk and dawn because those are times when the veil between worlds is thin so it is believed that you have more ability to um see and work with and participate basically yeah with totally the fae. totally yeah we definitely have experience with that <laughs> yeah 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 rebel rousing and such like that but yeah so those are the correspondences and if you want the complete list of correspondences as well as the book of shadows page for this podcast yes i know that i am currently two behind and with this podcast going live it makes me three behind but we're getting ready for fanime so that's whatever and actually the La beltane 102 i'm like three quarters of the way done but that's neither here nor yeah. there. They'll be uh, out soon. They'll be out soon. Yeah, they'll they'll be you know as soon as I get back from Phantom, I can just double down on those. But so yeah, if you want uh, the Book of Shadows pages and like the full list of correspondences and all that kind of stuff, all of that stuff's available on our Patreon. We have a Horn and Cauldron podcast tier, and uh, that's how you get access to that stuff, uh, as well as like a Discord channel where we can like where we like chit chat and such like that, uh, and then. Um, yeah, speaking of Patreon, I'd like to thank our patrons, Alan, Miranda, Helena, Jeff, Alexa, and Adrian. You guys are awesome. Stay awesome. Um, you know, you guys help us do this better every time. Yeah, thank and, you guys uh, so much. And all that. I mean, we're hosting a panel at Fanime that's... It's very exciting. It's very exciting. It's very stressful. It's a little it's a, terrifying. A, a, a yeah. bunch of stuff, yeah. Well, it's one it's, thing to do this in front of, like, lights, and a camera in and our like home. The dogs. And but the dogs. like, it's going to be like, it's just, I'm, I but got doing the whole it in time. Front of like an I'm audience. thinking about the stuff that are, that it's just going to be like me just like staring into the middle distance, except for there's just going to be people watching us do it. And like, <laughs> of course, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation for this one. Um, and so it's like, all right, how are we going to control this? Where can we set up the camera? How is the microphone going to work? Um, I don't know exactly what room it's in and I'm not going to have any opportunity to like test any of this. So I'm just going to have to like show up and do it off the cuff, yeah. which is a bit stressful, but you know, whatever. Uh, we're excited. So stay tuned for that. The uh, magic in anime um, yep. podcast episode. So that'll probably displace a, um, a pub chat. We'll probably replace a pub chat with the Fanime special edition one, since it's basically the magic and media portion of a pub chat, but just like but like extra long, like like balloon to taking over the entire episode. Yeah. Um. So in that one, actually, that'll probably be longer than this episode today. Uh. But so that one will be a little bit longer. But uh. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it. We watched uh five really interesting anime. Yeah. Uh. And like took notes on them so we can talk about like different sort of like magical associations and practices present in these anime, which is which is fun. We uh, we we chose five. I think the list of anime just off the top of my head with no research was like twenty. So. Um, yeah. 
you know, it, hopefully the podcast works out and we can keep doing more um, uh, the podcast, the uh, panel. Excuse me. <laughs> hopefully this all works out, guys. That's fine. I am, man, I am exhausted. It has been hot today and my brain is just like, it has been hot and we have been working guy, on convention sh stuff nonstop. Sh shut it down. Right. But, um, no, I, you know, if the panel works out, which I, which, you know, I hope it does, then we'll probably do that again, uh, at the following Fanime. Uh, there's a bunch of anime out there. So, you know, stay tuned for that. Yeah. Also, because we do magic and media with our, um, pub chat episodes every other week, like if there's a movie or show or thing that you watch that has like some dope magic in it, and you would like us to talk about that, uh, just send us like, Hey, I watch this show check it out yeah right? i mean that's like legit it's like 50 percent of the conversations i have with anybody <laughs> it's just like i just watched this thing and they're just like i just watched this thing let's let's watch the other things and then talk about it for yeah you know for three days before the next thing comes out for us to talk about <laughs> um <laughs> star trek <laughs> but uh yeah so anywho the next episode is going to be episode nine of the pub chat so submit your questions uh, about whatever for that so we can have some uh user questions for that although that episode will probably be displaced so it'll be in like early whatever the next month is june and yeah. um then the next full length podcast episode is coming out on the 6th and that's episode 40, which is crazy. We're at 40 episodes already. And uh, that's Midsummer 102. Yeah. So prepare for that one by listening to episode 15, which is Midsummer 101. Yep. And uh, kind of get that baseline there because for the 102s, if you haven't listened to them, we sort of deep dive into a particular aspect or yeah, a couple of aspects. We focus on just one or two aspects of the like um of the like the greater idea of like midsummer and then you know we kind of dive into that give you like a little bit of a deep dive on yep. those which is real cool so yeah stay tuned for that but uh either way i've been john norgrove this has been julie norgrove this is the horn and cauldron podcast, podcast and we will catch you guys next time stay magical folks yeah and don't forget breathe in self-confidence and breathe out self-doubt mm -hmm.